So Ranid was talking earlier on about um, artificial intelligence and the ant mentality and the ant syndrome. So I just thought I'll quickly paraphrase Randir. Um, and, and imagine that he'd think that, that uh, four legs is good, two legs is indeed better, and artificial intelligence is probably the best. So I'm going to start talking about some, some, some examples that had happened um, that I managed to troll. And the story goes that a particular parent phoned at the Target stores, Target is a very, very large store in the US, and lodged a very serious complaint about them accusing his 17-year-old daughter of being <coughs> pregnant. I mean, it was his daughter, and he knew his child very well. And of course, she couldn't be pregnant. So the target profusely apologized, thinking that they're going to have a lawsuit on their hands. And they sent very, very senior people to apologize to him personally. A few weeks later, the same parent phoned target to apologize and to inform target that, indeed, his daughter was pregnant. So. Target had known that his daughter was pregnant before he did. And these are the kinds of things that are happening in, 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 in this grand scheme of things, that things start to happen to us sometime before we are aware of it, or sometimes as we become aware of it. And, and this is a very, very interesting thing, because you are what you purchase, but your purchasing habit changes as your health changes. And through pattern recognition, through tagging events that are similar, you can actually make predictions about a particular thing, and I'll show you some examples just now. But here's the interesting thing. Um, this morning, I actually stopped Randir and I asked him to give a special lecture that he had given to me. Uh, I, I, I belong to a special class, so he had to give me a special lecture. And uh, he, he was teaching me about auto scholar. And the thing that I find interesting about the work that he was doing is that He's worried about throughput, as indeed all of us are as, as academics, and, and how do you get from first year to final year and graduation. Right, so so our, our, our goal is what? Throughput in the minimum time. Okay, and we understand that we have quintile one, quintile two, we have other challenges, they fall in love, they fall out of love, and they discover beer, and all the other happy things that, that, that happens to students. And these are variables that we need to factor into the equation as well. Now, the whole point is that when you start looking at first year, second year, or, or, or between a particular year, the correlation of the subjects that they do and the marks that they get, and then that will, that will be your intra, and then your inter, your first year, your second year correlation, correlation between first subjects in your first year and your second year and your third year, and you can find blockages, and I'm not going to say any more about that because I know he's going to regale us with, with, with that just now. What I am going to say is that these, these kind of correlations also exist in real time in shopping patterns in stores. So stores are now starting to, to predict when people will do particular things. Uh, yesterday would have been a good day to sell ponchos. Yeah. You know, so it's obvious, right? It's, certain things are, are so easy and so obvious that we need a computer to tell us because we've forgotten how to do obvious and easy things. Right? So, and, and if you look at all the, the, the issues in terms of the companies, what I'd like you to do as well is to think about your data and what your data can tell you. And please, people, I, I've, I've learned this the hard way in the sugar industry. The chemical engineers are very, very clever. Never talk to them. Go and talk to the plant engineer. Go and talk to the workers on the shop floor. After you speak to all of them, then you go to the chemical engineer. The chemical engineer is the expert in data, but macro level. You want to talk about the meta and the meso level. When you talk to a plant level person, Many of you may not know this, but uh, I'm going to tell you a secret about Ravi. He's a very, very good mechanic. So if your car gives you a problem, go to him. Uh, I'm not sure he's going to be happy that I'm telling you that. But he really, really is a good mechanic. And mechanics listen to a car. They don't go to a mechanical engineering. They listen to a car. They see things that are about to happen to your vehicle before you happen. So start looking to your data and start listening to your data. And if you can't listen or feel your data or get a sense or start loving your data, talk to somebody else who has that love. And that love is there. Uh, in, in the context of climate analysis, if you go and talk to the farmers, they know certain parts of the farm experience different climate relative to, to the same farm in another area. What are causing that? Is, is it weather patterns, wind patterns, and that, those kind of things? So you need to have somebody that's on the ground that understands those type of things. And if you can remember that for me, that will be great. So yesterday uh, was a very cold day. Um, some of you who read the, the, the Independent on Saturday would have noticed that there was a warning by Aishcom that we may have this thing called load shaking again. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that, but there was a, a warning alert put out because there was a cold front that hit the Berg, and our Berlin Wall, and they said that uh, be warned that there may be a, a, a load shedding this week. And it didn't happen, but it got me very worried because I, I, my kids are in school, and you know the usual thing. So I ran and pulled out all those things and started charging everything. 
Now, if you had to look at it from another point of view, from a business point of view, and re-interpolate that, why didn't you do what these pizza people have done? They anticipate where there's a power outage. They send SMS to all the people in the area where there's a power outage and remind them, by the way, you ring, we bring. So we can solve your food problem. So, you know, again, it's, it's taking opportunity of a thing that happens very, very quickly indeed. I'm going to talk about this just now. Let me just talk about, okay, let's talk about this. So this is my, the work that I do now. I now work at, at, a, at, at, um, at the UNDP level uh, on, on, on Elections. I, elections is my thing, and in particular, I do electronic voting. But that hasn't happened in this country. But that's not the point. Um, one of the challenges that all the worlds are having, South Africa. Those of you will remember the clock car incident, where the Constitution Court has, has ruled that everybody in this country has to have a street address in order to be registered as a voter. Now, that's a huge issue for the IEC and for people as voters because it's a sense of dignity. Even if you live in an informal settlement, you still have an abode. You still have a GPS location and a coordinate. So the, the whole issue of, of, voter, of, of voter registration is becoming a serious problem. Now, your photographs that you take, we use this thing here, right, your photo ID. The photographs that you take, you think it's very easy. Uh, are there any Islamic people here? You have seen any, any, any female Islamic? Well, you know they wear the hajib or the burqa. And that, that creates challenges in terms of facial recognition software. So when you take a photograph, it creates another kind of issue. So what do you do with, with, with photo recognition? And there's another issue. In some parts of, of Africa, like Benin and Toga, they have this thing there. I was happily taking photographs of the people as I was observing an election there. And they wanted to lynch me. I didn't know why. Because they, apparently there's this traditional thing that says that you, you take my photograph, you capture my soul. It happens in small pockets of places. So you need to be culturally sensitive in certain areas and certain contexts. I don't know whether they were game playing, by the way. I don't know whether it's an act of gamemanship. But that's not the point. They felt that way at that particular point, and I had to respect that. So the naive view that a photograph is a good thing is not so, not so great anymore. OK, so let's talk about fingerprints. Fingerprint is fantastic, right? Fantastic. Uh, everyone can use fingerprints in, under any context. No. Baseball players have no fingerprints. I'm talking about the rich, super rich, billionaire dollar baseball players from where he comes from. Right? Those guys have no fingerprint. No, no fingerprint that can distinguish them from someone else. The same is true for our farmers in deep rural Africa. So when you start thinking about the data that you use and you think that the data is unique, start asking yourself people, ask, asking people in that particular ecosystem, what do you mean by unique data? And how, how do you differentiate that unique from any other unique? Can you tie that data with other data sets or create a data element set? that can, in fact, give you that uniqueness that you so desire and so look. We might even be looking at uh, some missing data the day after tomorrow. You see? OK. Right. So, so this is the one that was done there. Now, when you have this type of thing, I, I, gentlemen and ladies, I put this slide in here, not for me to talk about, just for you to think about, uh, so that when you have data and, and, and unique data, you have something called a false acceptance rate and a false rejection rate. Don't worry about it technically. Read it. Those of you that, that find that it has some resonance in your studies, please talk to me about it, OK? So I put some slides in here that, that are, OK, to impress you. How's that? All right? So, so, but if you read through it as you go through it, if it has some resonance in the work that you are doing, then we can surely talk about it, all right? So I left a lot of slides that are also hidden in here from my other talks that I do. So have a look at this. Those of you that are working in that need unique identity for data, look at this slide here and talk to me. Um, Anytime this week. Right, so this one. The weather pattern this week here got me, firstly I found the pizza one and I was excited, and then this one here. Weather pattern creates delays in planes. And when you, when, your flight, when you miss your flight, you need accommodation. Where do you go? How do you, how do, you do that? So the Red Roof Inn, what they did was they, they discovered that in the, U, in, in the United States, 1% of all flights every day are canceled or postponed or delayed for whatever reason, meaning that the person will not be able to travel to the destination, meaning that they will need accommodation, meaning that there is an opportunity. So what did Red Roof Inn do? They created a collage of available services, bed and breakfast peoples around the area, around the airport, where they created, they created an ecosystem, an erythropolis. Rabbi told me something very interesting about erythropolis economy, which I, which I never forget. He said that O.R. Tembo is the only construction site in the world with its own airport. You need to think about that one. Owar Tambo is the only construction site in the world with its own airport. Meaning that that airport is growing so much every single day. There's never a day when there's no 
construction happening at that. It's no longer an airport, it's a construction site. But for this particular example, can you see how clear, how clever it was taking available data, aggregating data, but they did one more. They anticipated when the, when, when the typhoons were going to come, when the wind was going to come, when the bad weather was going to come. So they anticipated it, and they already had people to fly at the airport saying, you don't know it yet, but I'm telling you, you're not going anyway today. So buy, the buy, buy your accommodation now, and you'll get a discount. Right, so let's talk about UPS and trucking and FedEx, and you know all of these guys, right? Now, here's the interesting thing. People think that big data is like, uh, let me give you an example of big data. A telecom, about five years ago, used to print about 12 kilometers of invoices per month. You think that's impressive, right? But it's such easy data because the data is structured. It's, it's, there's, a, there's a record, there's your name, there's your address, there's a number of calls you made, and all you had to do was run through a system. We call it a batch file. Just run, 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 compute, 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 print, 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 print. So you've got 12 kilometers of, of data, a small part of a forest gone. Everyone's not happy about that, but, you know. So, and, and you got that, but it, it not really is impressive because it's just big computation. This now is impressive because UPS and FedEx and all of these guys are not only using big data to track transactions. Transactions is easy. Transactions all of us can do. What is becoming interesting now, UPS is now looking at the trucks, the vehicle, the logistics. It is now tracking the logistics of the vehicle as they move from place to place, looking at what they call, his favorite word, Dick Stars, shortest path algorithm. How do you get from point A to point B as quickly as possible? Recognizing that you have things called traffic, recognizing that we and I have in this country called potholes, recognizing bad roads, recognizing taxis, etc., etc. How do you get from one point to another? It's not just as a crow flies, right? It's not just the shortest part, it's also the most efficient part in terms of your petrol consumption and things like that. Do we have other examples in South Africa? Of course we do. Discovery. How many of you are discovery? Right, so you know what you, you, you are being. Uh, they use telemetry services to track your vehicle in real time, but there's a whole lot of other. Bottom line events that come there. They know that if you drive better, you are calmer. If you are calmer, you're less likely to get stressed. If you're less likely to get stressed, you're less likely to get sick. More money they make out of you, out of the same one. So it's a really nice way of, of having these loyalty points in real time, providing a monitoring service to you. So these types of things that you're looking at provide all types of real time services. So I told you guys, my thing is, my thing is, is uh, I started up in, in computer science uh, and and. So, so somebody asked, what's the difference between a data scientist and, uh, and a computer science and, and the other people? So let's start with computer science first, right? So as computer scientists, we like the political scientists of the world. We need the word science in our profession. You know, we're not really scientists. Like a, like a mathematician is just a mathematician. The statistician is a statistician. But we, we computer scientists, political scientists. So we put pretty much the same. You know, we have uh, low self-esteem, I think. That, 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 that. Right, but, we, but computer scientists are guys that are into decision making in, into problem solving and I think that, that, that is the big thing that, that the computer scientists do. A statistician is into what is the problem, how do I analyze the problem, how do I reach a conclusion using whatever technique that I can. So a data scientist is a guy that, well, he knows more programming than a statistician. Okay? So you know, you, that, that, that's kind of the way you need to look at it and he also knows a bit more statistics than a programmer. So that, that's the kind of unique set, that mindset that he fits in. So it is a multidisciplinary one. My current thing after working with data all my time is that I discovered the beauty of unstructured data. That the world, 90% of the data that's all created now is social media data. And I tell you what, I am totally fascinated by, by the rubbish that you all write on, 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 on Facebook. <laughs> right? And I'm part of that rubbish, and I, I, I'll freely admit it, right? But it is so amazing to find things here. And we will see that uh, Twitter knows when, the, when, when there's a flu pandemic or a flu academic uh, uh, sorry, a, a, a flu outbreak before the people even know it. You know you're sick, you know you're sick, you know you're sick. But in this particular room, through, due to people's tweeting, Twitter can actually say that in this neighborhood or this neck of the woods of Durban, there's a flu outbreak. So it's very, very interesting. Now, how can we take that as, as South African people? How about if we can now start tracking malaria outbreaks? How can we start doing that? You know, so there are a whole lot of interesting things. For example, for telemetry, by the way, what if every toll road during the, 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 what I call the, the dead season in this country, April and December, when we drive on the road and kill ourselves, you know that time? I mean, it's, it, it, it's worse than a small-scale war, the number, number of people that die in our country. What if we put a telemetry system on every car that left Durban and took it back from them when they reached Joburg and we could monitor every single vehicle in exchange for 100 grand of petrol? You know, something like that to, to, to condition people. So, that, that those are the types of things that we are working on now, trying to start to use unstructured data 
and telemetry data for, for social good. Look at this one. So the telcos were very reluctant to give the, tel the telecommunication data to anybody. Because, I mean, that, well, firstly, they're lazy. Okay, just understand that. Nobody, <coughs> you think that I, uh, Apple doesn't want to give you the data because of data protection and all of that. Well, Google also, think about it another way. They will have to create a whole division of people to give you the data that you want, your password and decrypt and all of those things. So there's an inherent laziness in them not to do it. But of course, they'll hide behind things like protection of information and security and uh, invasion of privacy and all the other things that Victor will talk to us about later. But in this particular case, the telco declined to give the information. They persisted. Now, here's a story behind this. Lee Matthews was a student in, in Bolton University. She was 21 years old. Uh, she was murdered by that freak down there, right? And everybody kind of knew that he did it, but nobody could put the, the, the crime and the person together. There was no way, they couldn't, they, they couldn't work out why the body was, was, was it, the body did not perform, where, where's the anatomy person? Where's the anatomist? Yes. So the body did not decompose at the rate that they thought it would and all of the things that you understand. So there was a whole kind of, they, they couldn't understand it, but, but they knew he was involved somehow. So finally, when they managed to get the, the, the MTN to the least data, they realized that they could position him two feet away from the, where the body was finally discovered on, on the mid on the mid -end. So they could triangulate the man's phone, therefore him, with the body. And that is how it was done. And that was the start of, of using uh, cell phone triangulation in this country for, for crime uh, detection and, and resolution. And I think that the, those are the types of things that you see. Big data is not only about exabytes and terabytes and zettabytes of data. It's also about clever use of information that you already have, or looking at the information. That's why I said, talk to the mechanic. By the way, he'll fix your car. Ravi is very good. <laughs> right? So I started looking at this. Now, this is another real story. Again, the joy of, of, of social media and unstructured data. Katie Lewis is from Devon North. She was 12 years old. She fell in love with a Facebook chummy. And this chummy was actually a 35-year-old jerk. But he, he claimed to be 18. And of course, they fell in love with each other. Well, the, the, the speed of her, right? So he harvested her over a period of time. Eventually, she left home and, and ran away and went to him. And she discovered this joke. But he managed to persuade her because the hook was already there. You know, she, she was a young child. Here's the interesting thing. When she was kidnapped, she was 800 meters away from my house. I live in Malvern. And there was I sitting all my time on the internet helping to crowd search for this child. OK? So what happened? One of the policemen from the child protection unit started going through her data. And this is where I have a big fight with Facebook and, 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 and Google. We're actually starting, we're starting an advocacy moment because the day you can't speak for yourself, that is the day I need access to your social media account so that I can work out where you are. You know all those tagging things that you do? In the car, at the come shopping, finish shopping, in the car, packing the car, driving at the robot, going, you know all those things that you do? We, it, it, it's annoying, but at least we know where you are. You know, so we can, we can start uh, tracking and triangulating you. So the, the, the child protection unit guy found one SMS, one SMS that she sent using the other guy's phone to one of her friends. They triangulated again, and they worked out. They found him in Second Avenue in Malvern, and she, and she was rescued. And now, again, this is the beauty of All of you will remember uh, Help Find Our Durban Child. Remember that one that happened a few weeks ago in March? Now, here's the interesting thing about Help Find Our Durban Child. The child wasn't missing. But due to the force and nature and the number of tweets and all of that, the two people who were, who were guilty eventually had to give up. You know, they were just convinced by, by that. So, so you had that type of thing happening. So this is him, successful story, wonderful story. And up to now, I can't get over the fact that she was 800 meters away from me, and I was spending all my time online trying to find her. Uh, isn't it amazing that we don't know where to look sometimes, eh? Sometimes, you know, you need to get off your butt and do something rather than, you know, do other things. All right, so this one here, another exciting, interesting, interesting, interesting use of social media and big data and clever use of big data. So this guy was uh, carjacked. They took him and they threw him into the boot of his own car, a golf. What is it about kids and golfs? So there he was in the golf, but they didn't take his phone away from him. So he tweeted to his girlfriend, I am carjacked, help me. So this girl, Tanisha Reddy, immediately retweeted and help my boy, you friend, you'll see that she spelled the name incorrectly in one of the uh, previous tweets. She tweeted it to her friends. She only had 42 friends. She asked he, asked he stands for retweeted it. But, but she did it in desperation because, I mean, what else do you do? You don't know what else to do, right? Now, one of the 42 friends sent it to a person by the name of Pig Spotter. Anybody know Pig Spotter user in this country? You see, he drinks. I know. 
Because Pig Spotter is a guy that watches the police and the roadblocks, so you know where the roadblocks are. And so Pig Spotter is actually a naughty guy, right? But I mean, he just watches them. But in, in, in Joburg, they have a lot of fun avoiding police. I don't know why, but they do that. So Pig Spotter has 110,000 followers. So when Tanisha retweeted it, Pig Spotter picked it up. When Pig Spotter picked it up, the tweet went viral. They found the person within three and a half hours. So this is the power of the positive power of crowdsourcing and crowd searching and using data in a way that you never thought of before. Okay? Now, what about the other way? We have this thing in America in 2011 called the Crackberry Riots after Blackberry. What had happened was the Yobs in, in the UK, they would say, we're going to meet in, in, uh, in Fleet Street, on the corner of Fleet Street and whatever the other street is. And they would all meet at 10 o'clock at night and they'll all just bang the window, smash and grab and run away. They did this for about three weeks in a row. The UK government forced BlackBerry to open their system so that they could start mitigating these types of BlackBerry riots that were going on, where groups of people just got together and randomly attacked uh, stores. So you have the great news of, the, of I told you about Kayleen Lewis and all of that, and then you have the other, the other, the flip side of it. So we need to be careful about how we use data constructively and negatively. The MA370, all of you know this one, right? So MA370 is still missing. Plane still hasn't been found, and a lot of hardship and heartache for all of the people. So there's this company called Digital Globe. They have 2.3 million people pouring through 42,000 square meters of, of uh, satellite images, looking to see if they can find evidence of this particular plane. And every pixel of every image is examined by at least 30 different people before they can start. So they, 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 the effort is ongoing, and, and we're hoping that somewhere along the line, by the way, they found other things. They found other shipwrecks and things like that. So it's quite interesting, you know. So I mean, but but the but the destination is finding MH370. So the journey is finding other things, but the destination is very very interesting. And again, this is the power of, of leveraging people and and social media and things like that. So for your for your data, do not be afraid to go online and tell people what you are doing because people will come to you after that, and they'll bring other people. They'll bring their networks with you. So I spoke about flu prediction. I'm not going to go any further than that except to show you the slide. And basically, they have this thing called a, a trend map. And once you watch, look at the trend map, you can see as the trends get more and more closer, it means that the events are starting to affect each other. OK, so by the way, uh, Twitter can do it. Google can do it as well. So Google also claim, Google claims that they can do it in a day. Uh, Twitter is now saying they can do it in six hours. So, OK, so these are the types of data that you're looking at. Um, Randy, you've spoken about this already, so I'm not going to speak too much about it. Except that you'll notice that the triangle is going the other way now. So the business is on the top. The business processing is right at the top. You see how small the amount comparatively, whereas the, the different types of information, your, your mobile data, your video data, and your social media data is now going towards the bottom. Okay, so this is an example of, again, in another way, of, of a different type of data that, that each uh, business vertical has. Again, I put this for completeness. Guys, you can have a look at this when, and see which factor bothers you. If it, doesn't, if it doesn't, throw the page away. OK, so this is what Ranir was talking about earlier in the morning. And I'm, I'm interested in this in, in, in trying to look at it in terms of a minute. You know, uh, In one minute, there are, well, this is a slightly older one, and uh, this slightly newer one uh, here. There's about 2 million searches on Google per minute. So once again, I put this in here for you to, um, you know, when you're having a cup of tea, you can look at it. But the salient point here is the following. One, we have structured data, which is typically your business data and your, and your transactional data. Two, we have semi-structured data, uh, and, and that falls midway between that and your unstructured data. And your semi-structured data will be data that, that we know about you, real data, your cell phone number, and things that you say with it, like your tweets and things like that, which is which has a structure because it's 140 characters long. But what you put in it, your emoticons and, 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 and any, uh, anybody under 24 here, 23? You look 21. Why, why is it that when you reach university, the number of letters in the alphabet changes from 26 to 21? You notice that they drop all the vowel symbols out of this. You know, that A-E-I-O-U does not exist in, the, in, the, in, their, in their text. Read it. You can actually work out the age of a person by by just working at the number of letters they use in, in, in their communication, right? So that, that. Um, so, okay, Tandy spoke about that. There's an issue here about, about the ethics and data because with data, folks, you have so much of data and all of you are going to be collecting data at some point. Every bit of data that you collect can 
can have a dramatic effect on, th on somebody's life. And you need to be very, very careful about that, about that issue. I know your ethics committee is going to give you hell about other things. And sometimes we do that ethics committee thing as a form filling process. That's what I do. And those guys, sit, I just fill it. I fill it in for them. I don't fill it in for me. I'll be very honest with you. The ethical committee and me, uh, never mind. Supervisors are here. We mustn't talk about it. But they, so you do it twice. You do it once for the, ethical, for the ethics committee so your research process can go forward. But I, w I would like you to challenge you also to do it for yourself in another way. Start looking at the ethical dimensions of that for yourself and how you can positively and negatively influence the world. I gave you the example of crowd searching for Katie Lewis. I gave you the negative example of the Crackberry rights. Same technology, one was a positive use, one was a negative use. So see your data and see how you can use that data to change the world, but also be aware how your data can negatively change the world through no, no fault of yours, except the fact that you have the data there. And because the data is related to each other, it's telling you stories that maybe people don't want to hear. Okay, so here's an interesting one. I, I like the picture, that's firstly. Don't ask me why. I mean, I'm into photography, you see. So, so here's the thing, Benetton and Gillette are, are two interesting companies in the world, and, and, and they collect a lot of data. But they didn't know who was buying, Benetton did not know who was buying their shirts, and Gillette did not know who was buying their shaving kits. Now, it's a no-brainer that I'll use the shaving kit here, and the lady will probably use it there, right? I mean, that's how these things work. Some guys also, I suppose, would use it there, maybe. But, you know, that, that, that's up to them and, and their bathroom and whatever they do. But the question I'm asking is, who is buying, who is buying it? Is it the mother buying it? Is it the fiancé buying it? Is it the person himself buying it? I don't know, and neither did they. So they started, in the, so what they did was they put tags in, in the, they put tags in each of the, packs that you buy, or the shirt, or the, 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 the blades. And outside the store, as you walked out, they had a camera and they had a reader. So as you walked through the reading plane, it recognized you because your tag was in your bag, and the camera turned on automatically, and it took a picture of you. Okay? Now what is that? Invasion of privacy. Because you weren't aware that the act of purchasing it, which was a private purchase, would now be converted into an out-of-store experience where your picture was taken illegally. Right? So this is how this one came about. I'd rather go naked than buy Benetton. I'd rather go naked than buy Gillette. So you can see the, the, the dramatic way this lady had used that. I just like the picture, but I'm just telling you the story behind it, right? The dramatic way that this, this actually, this, this protest movement has spread out. And actually, within a couple of weeks of this happening, both these stores apologized to the world and, 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 and stopped that particular event. Okay. So this one here, I mean, this is where data, data, every way, don't know what to do with it, so we throw away 99.9999% of it. At, at, the, at the particle accelerator, 99.9999, actually up to five nines, doesn't it? Up to five nines, hey? 99.99999 of the data is thrown away, and only that little bit of data is, is, is collected and they're analyzing that. Can you imagine how much of data has been wasted? And if we had it, what would they do with it? So, you know, so sometimes don't think that collecting all the data is going to help you. In the beginning, try to collect it all because you don't know what you're going to throw away. But as you get smarter, start becoming a little bit more picky and choosy in the data that you get. Right? Um, this is an interesting problem, uh, a piracy in, 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 in the, of the Somali coast especially. Uh, you know, people have been talking about this, and now they're talking about how can we use technology to start tracking and preventing uh, um, piracy from occurring on, on that particular coast. Um, some people have claimed success. What is success? I mean, as long as one ship is pi pi officially pirated, it doesn't stop, right? But it has dramatically reduced. That's the point. Okay. I'm not going to talk about this now. No. So there are some technologies that, 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 that can be used to do big data analysis, right? Um, Randine is going to introduce to one particular set. Vic is probably going to introduce you to another. And then I work with some other things. Um, I, 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 we are doing... Yasin, Randir, and myself writing a paper on, on social media and sentiment analysis. We collected the, uh, we used uh, Ravi's money, they kind of him. We, we, we bought uh, 700,000 uh, tweets, that all the tweets for, on, on the Fees Must Fall campaign. And now we're looking at the tweets to see what trigger mechanisms occurred, like the burning of the library. What, what, how did that influence from that event onwards? Because remember, when Fees Must Fall started, everybody was enamored by it well for on the student side, and then certain events occurred which started challenging our, 
our neutrality or our support of them. And, and, and which way did it go? So you've got things like word clouds and emoticons and all that analysis that needs to happen. Very, very unstructured, uh, unstructured data, but very, very exciting data to work with. So we'll be using uh, different types of tools like um, um, Python and R and, and other words that you may have heard. Guys, there's one important thing I want to tell you, right? Is that we, we, we program. Don't get hung up on the code. Get hung up on the data. I, I like what you said, you know, uh, you know, it, it, the, the, you're lost in a sea of data. Uh, you know, it, it's a nice place to be. The don't, don't, don't get hung up, get hung up on the, on the decision of the data as opposed to what you're going to do with it, as opposed to what can be done. And don't, don't try to become a programmer straight away. Start becoming a problem solver. What is the problem? Ravi is going to talk about that. What is the problem? Never mind the amount of data. What is the problem? <coughs> Uh, so these are languages and these are methodologies. Again, I put them in there. When you read them, one day this chart will speak to you. When it does, you can call us, okay? And, and we'll talk. I don't want to use words that, that, will, that will just make you not want to have tea with me. Okay? So, so this, today is easy because it's 140 and everyone hashtags everything. And, you know, you can start doing that. But then when emoticons came on, it kind of made it a little bit more exciting from a from a parsing point of view and from an analysis point of view. Okay, so these are the types of things that we are doing now. We, we're working on, on, on sentiment analysis. Um, again, there's, there's R, there's Python, there's SAS. Again, these are just technologies, means to an end, right? So you find a particular tool, and you find somebody who can use that tool, and then you do it. Uh, one of the reasons I was saying that Python is not a bad idea, uh, my colleague from IS&T might not, might not agree with me because I'm from the computer science side and she's from the other campus or the other, um, is that you have a sea of Python programmers in, the, in your computer science faculty. So if I were you, if you're looking for support, that's not a bad place to start. JavaScript is where you started this week with Randeer. But if you ever need to get really, really up there with other, other people and support, then look at Python only because of the kids that are there already on, on, on your other campus. Okay, I'm not going to talk about architecture as well. Again, people, as I say, this is here, firstly, to impress you, and secondly, just for continuity in terms of it being one contiguous hole for you to read. All right? So, and Randit has already alluded to this type of thing in terms of, uh, you know, you get words like SAN, storage area networks, then you got words like cloud computing, then another one people say SAS, S-A-A-S, software as a service, and then people talk about P-A-A-S, platform as a service. So, you know, you've got all kinds of things that are sitting up there somewhere in a cloud that somebody does something with. Your issue is, is you don't care who does what with it. You just want your data to be analyzed and, 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 and you want a, a, an answer to your thing. But you need to understand the nature and the patterns in your data. Okay. So, I think I'm going to stop here, except to say one thing. Some of you, when you get your, your PhDs, uh, you, you are what you tweet, you are what you post, once it's out there, it can never come back. So whenever you go out there and you say things to everybody, please be careful what you say, because when you get your PhD, you're going to want another job, and someone's going to Google you and find out what you said. And when they find it, they're not going to tell you what they found. They're going to tell you your, your application has been unsuccessful. OK, so I don't know why I'm telling you that, but I think she wanted me to say that. So there you go. All right, so can I stop at this point, people? And, and there are a whole lot of videos and things like that that I put in there. And, and we can take up our discussions uh, later. Thank you, guys.